We have a rich legacy of music written across the ages and even today. Uh, the, the great glorious story about the crucifixion and resurrection of our Savior. You know, you every now and then I'll bet you I see clips on the news and Facebook of people at different concerts singing. Folks, nobody, nobody should be able to outsing us because we have a reason to sing that the rest of the world doesn't know anything about. Thank you, Josh, for leading us. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel. Chapter 14, we began looking last week at this section, verses 26 to 42. We're going to come back to it today with the backdrop of the, uh, of the responsive reading uh, that we be read together. Jesus says, I have a baptism to be baptized with. He's about to be immersed in suffering. And he says, I'm straightened. I'm, we get the idea of a straight jacket. I am, I am squeezed, pressed until it's accomplished. Mark chapter 14, verses 26 to 42. I hope you found that in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put the text on the screen for you, but I do like for you to have your own Bible, and we can find one for you if you need one. Stand with me if you would and follow along as I read from this portion of Mark's Gospel. We're in Passion Week. We're in the last week of his life before he goes to the cross. We're in Passover. Coming away from Passover and going to the Mount of Olives and all the excruciating trial culminating in the crucifixion. We're just hours away from our Savior. When they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he, that is Peter, said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. Remain here and watch. Going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed, the Son of Man has been betrayed, into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And folks, we are in a time. Someone wrote me earlier this week and asked, do you think the problems we're facing, the, how it's reached a crescendo pitch as the presidential election comes upon us, do you think... That any of these problems can be traced back to the church. And I told them, I said, what we're facing in our culture today is a direct result of the failure in the pulpit and the apathy in the pew. 
we read this today and we need to ask ourselves, would Jesus say to us, will you, will you sleep? Will you sleep? My prayer for me and for you is that he will find us watching and waiting, watching and praying, just as he admonishes his disciples to do. Thank you. Please be seated. We told you last week that this is the beginning of Jesus' agony. Oh, the agony on the cross will be intense, but the language he uses leading up to this, the John passage that we read, the, the, this passage here, this, this, he, is, he is feeling the intensity of what is coming to him. Here's the eternal Son of God. He has never known anything but face-to-face -face communion with God the Father for all of eternity until he came to earth born as a babe and even as he grew in wisdom and in stature he grew in favor with God and man and he communed with his father so much so that when he when he was misplaced by his parents in their trip to the temple and they came back in a hurry to find him all flustered he said why does it surprise you that I would be about my father's business he had this this God consciousness about him he when he when he called his disciples they would oftentimes find him missing and he would be gone to pray, to, to draw aside alone before God. This face-to-face -face communion with the Father and now he is facing something that he has never known. That is the wrath of God upon him. The prospect of that presses him in and his human nature is overwhelmed and we're going to see this here and it, from this point on everything we read about the Savior from John's got from Mark's gospel is going to speak of increasing agony leading to unspeakable suffering bless God I'm not stopping there ending in resurrection and ascension but for these studies. Consider the agony of your suffering Savior. We told you last week that, that we want to open up this passage along four uh, headings. First, this, this warning and word of hope. Uh, second, the sincere, a sincere promise and a sober prediction. Third, the agony begins. We focus on that. And then fourth, we see he's abandoned in his agony. In the last week, we, we looked at this word of warning or warning and a word of hope. He, verses 26 and 27 and 28, when, they, when they'd sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus said to them, you'll fall, all fall away, uh, for it's written, I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That's a citation from Zechariah 13, 7. We looked at that last week. And then he told them, but after I'm raised up, I will go before you. There's this, this warning that all were going to fall away. We we took great pain in reading that, but also comfort to know that he knew that ahead of time. He knew that before he ever chose them. He knew what you were going to be like before he ever chose you, before he ever set his heart upon you to die for you and sent his spirit to save you. He knew. And one of the, some of those haunting words in all of the Bible are found in, in the letters of the resurrected, ascended Jesus Christ to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And he says to all of them, I know. I know you, I know your works, I know your deeds. I... He knew you. Yet he saved you. He knew me. Yet he saved me. That's just, that's amazing. It's overwhelming. It's comforting. It's encouraging. He does not cast us off. We suggested to you then that we need to learn to be like him. Kind and compassionate. I confess to you, I struggle with that. If, I, if, I'd, if I'd been put in charge of this group, after this episode in Gethsemane, I'd have fired them all. I'd have fired them all. But then you know something? I'd have had to fire myself too. Jesus is so compassionate with us. We need to be so as well. We suggested to you also that when we don't listen to his word, when we, when we read over it, we miss some things and we miss a lot of comfort from it. He, He's just told them something that is shocking. You're all going to fall away because of what's about to happen to me. 
But after I'm risen, and they missed that part. In fact, I would suggest to you that when he said that, Peter began to go through his mind. I, I don't know about the rest of these guys, but not me. And he's gonna, he says as much. He is, he is so getting ready to, to break in and say, not me, that he misses Jesus saying, after I'm risen. We miss a lot of comfort, brothers and sisters, if we don't, if we don't hear with a, with a view to, to taking in and doing and feeding upon the Word of God. In fact, I get concerned sometimes that, that, that we may hear it preached and read and taught and may read it ourselves so much that we just gloss over. We need to guard against that. A, a, an unholy, unhealthy familiarity. You know, the familiarity breeds contempt, some people say. that You see it in relationships sometimes. Guard your heart. Come to the Word of God fresh. Come to the Word of God as if, as if there's been a knock on your door. And someone says, Jesus is here to talk to you. Never grow old. Never grow dull. Because when you do, you miss a lot of the comfort, the encouragement. Everything that was written beforehand, Paul says to the Romans, everything that was written beforehand, the whole Old Testament, was written for us. That through the comfort and the, the, the provocation to persevere of the scriptures, the Old Testament, we might have hope. We're traveling through dark waters. No political party can save you. They're pretty much worthless right now. Probably have been for a long time. We just know that now. No branch of government can save you because they've colluded against you. The media will not save you. They tell you lies. You better find a place to anchor your soul and your hope and that is in the unchanging Word of God that tells us about the unchanging God. We need that. Secondly, I want you to see this sincere promise and this sober prediction. Now, Peter was sincere. But he was sincerely wrong. We've made promises like that. Even though they all fall away, he said, I will not. And then Jesus responds to him, which had to, be, had to be cutting to him. He may have missed what Jesus said earlier about, but when I am risen, I'll go to Galilee and see you there. He may have missed that. He didn't miss this. Truly, I tell you, this night, Before the rooster crows twice, in other words, before, before dawn. Now, you all have chickens. You, you have roosters? Yeah, and I understand why. We, we, uh, when we were children, remember when they used to dye chickens? Pastels, blue, pastel blue, pastel green. Well, well we, I'm sure I conned my mama into it because I don't think, you know, we lived in town. We got two of these little chicks, all right? My brother's was blue, mine was green. Came home for lunch one day. My chicken, what I could see of him, was in the mouth of a cat. They ran off and would not surrender my chicken. So I lost my chicken. Before he even changed colors, it was still green. I lost it. Well, the other one grew up. We named it Pat after a, after a lady, a friend of my sister's named Pat, a friend of the family. Excited about this chicken. We didn't know a whole lot about him. I thought it would be great to get eggs. But guess what? This chicken was Patrick. Sat in a fig tree right outside our window. The most piercing, shrill. I don't know how we, they even let us stay in town with it. Just as the sun was going, it would screech that cock a doodle doo sound. There's no way to oversleep. We finally had to get rid of Patrick just to wrap the story up because I looked out one day. I don't know a whole lot about chickens, but these roosters grew spurs on their feet, on the back of their feet, I think. And my neighbor next door was walking across our yard to her house with a bag full of groceries. And Patrick 
took chase. And the last thing I saw was this basket, this bag full of groceries going straight up in the air. This poor woman was running for her life from Patrick. So, so Patrick became a dinner guest at another friend of ours. That was the last we saw of Patrick. He's talking about this the root before the rooster crows twice. I mean, but by the way, our rooster never crowed only twice. Our rooster crowed and crowed and crowed. Before that, before sun comes up, you'll have denied me. Not just deny me, denied me three times. And when you when you see that in the narrative, you know it just when he had done that. It's a sober prediction. Brothers and sisters, we need to be careful. We need to guard against self-confidence. We need to guard against arrogant presumption. We, we need to guard our hearts as we see a culture that is growing so hostile. And we look at the hostility and we say, I would never be like that. Brothers and sisters, please. It is, the, it is only the oil of the grace of God poured upon you and me through the means that God has given us to employ that keeps us from being like that. I was in seminary with a young man. He and his wife seemed like, seemed like the ideal couple, a Barbie and Ken type. Graduated. He went on to serve in an associate role in a church in Austin. We didn't, didn't keep up, but then I saw in the Baptist Press headlines one day that he had been arrested for murdering his wife. Never got the details. But here's what we know. They got into an argument. He beat her to death with an axe on a Wednesday. Drove to church, to prayer meeting, and to lead choir rehearsal. Tossed the axe in the canal. His conscience began to bother him later on. He turned himself in. Brothers and sisters, we've got to recognize. Guard our hearts. Peter said, look, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all chimed in. Said, Me too, Lord. No, no, I'm, you can count on me. What's the point of this? Is, is, the, is the point to have a lackadaisical commitment? No, be wholeheartedly committed. I'll be committed, but, but be careful. We need to be careful and guard against vain boasting. You know, that's why James says, do not say tomorrow I'm going to do that. It says, if the Lord wills. You see, God being my helper. My heart's desire, as best I know my heart, is to finish well, to be faithful. I, can, I promise you, the older I get, and those of you who are, who are walking toward the sunset of life, here, you, you can identify with this. What I want to hear, I don't, I don't need to hear the accolades of men and women. I don't, but I, I want desperately to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to finish well. I want to finish strong. I want to do so humbly. It's a lesson we learn here. Peter arguably was as close to Jesus as any one of the twelve. Jesus poured into him. And at this phase of the, of the disciple-making training that we're talking about on Sunday nights, it begins to look like Jesus' time was wasted. Pentecost teaches us better. We need to remember that pride, uh, Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, and a, and a haughty, that is a puffed-up spirit, goes before the fall. We're warned. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, that he who thinks he stands, and then the, the image there, he who thinks he stands straight up, take heed, lest he falls. Proverbs 28, 6, he who trusts 
his own heart is a fool. You know, you hear people say every now and then, I know in the depths of my heart. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. You see, we only, we only make it moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, all the way. To the, we only make it by the grace of God. Martin Luther said, I preach justification by faith every week to my people because every week they forget it. In fact, Martin Luther was accused, and, and, and he wasn't the first. Paul was accused of this when he wrote to the church at Rome. Well, then, if, if, what you're, if it's all of grace, if it's all about the Lord's work, then, then let us sin boldly. Let us, let us sin that grace may abound. And Paul has a strong reputation of that. By no means. God forbid. You see, grace, understanding that salvation is all of grace from beginning to end. And everywhere in between does not lead to loose living. It leads to, to humble gratitude when rightly understood. I've told you before about one of my, and I, and I like, I generally like this, uh, this female country singer in a lot of her stuff. I, I say I don't know her discography, but I, I know a few of her songs. But this Reba McIntyre, The Heart Don't Lie, that is a lie. The heart does lie. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so you don't, you don't operate by just the temptation all of us have is to respond to life based on how we feel. Yet the scripture teaches us that we're to have this mind in us, which was in Christ Jesus, that, the, that our thoughts, captivated by the word of God, should shape and influence our feeling. And the culture we live in is driven by feeling and hates thoughtful argument. Brothers and sisters, you've got to realize that we are swimming upstream. And we've got to hang tenaciously to our children and grandchildren because they are being swept downstream in a torrent and taught that what really matters finally is how you feel. Now I'm not saying feelings don't matter, but I am telling you that, that feelings have got to be captured by knowledge, true knowledge of truth, because if they're not, your feelings will carry you places you never imagined you could go. I mean, I grew up in the generation that started the whole, if it feels good, do it, craze. There's a warning here as we see Peter's sincere but misguided declaration. We need to learn from it. Third thing I want to see with you here is Jesus' agony, the agony that begins. So, so he goes into this uh, the Mount of Olives into a garden called Gethsemane. And he takes, there's 11 of them, because Peter's, I mean, Judas is gone, remember? And so he says to eight of them, sit here while I pray. And then he takes Peter, James, and John, that inner circle, and goes deeper into the garden. They are nearer to him. If you get the picture, there are eight of them that are sort of on the, on the fringe of the garden. Peter and James and John are brought more directly into the, the middle of it. Spurgeon has a wonderful uh, devotion that I've read oftentimes in his morning and evening collection where he talks about when you're, when you're facing incredible suffering in life, when, when you're immersed in suffering, that you do not know how you will come through it or if you will come through it. He says, I would remind you that it's a precious privilege. He said, Jesus only took three into what Spurgeon calls the inner circle of his suffering. And it's a precious privilege to suffer on behalf of Christ. I, mean, I suggest to you, that's how, the, that's how the martyrs around the world, that's how the persecuted church makes it through the unspeakable atrocities that they face. As they recognize what the disciples, they, they went away rejoicing, counting it a privilege to have been beaten because they were so closely identified with Jesus Christ. And so, so Spurgeon makes this observation. It is precious 
It's a precious privilege to be allowed to be drawn into the inner circle of the sufferings of Christ. Because you see, folks, when we read the scripture clearly, we are most like him. We are most conformed to his image when we suffer for him and when we serve. You take those two elements out of life and we would, we would not even remotely identify with him. It's when we suffer. He's the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. And when we serve, he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He taught us that in Mark 10, 45. So he goes into this inner part of the garden. Peter and James and John are nearer than the other eight. And the text says he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. He's already spoken to it as the passage we read earlier in John. He's thinking, he's thinking about, I have this baptism to be baptized with and I'm straightened. I'm pressed until it, until it happens and now he is drawing ever nearer. Ever think about it. Be there with him. Judas leaves the room. It's, it is set in motion. Now he goes to pray. And he knows that his prayer, his time there, will be concluded by an event that sets in motion. Increasingly intensifying suffering. He's greatly distressed and troubled. And he, and he said to them, to Peter and James and John, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Brothers, draw near. Jesus says, I feel like I'm about to die. From the, from the deepest part of my being, I'm, I feel like I'm about to die. Remain here and watch. It could be argued that Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, doesn't need anything. But, but, but the human Jesus facing the tidal waves of suffering needed, I put quotes, needed friends who would watch and pray with him, for him. So going a little farther. He fell on the ground and prayed. And we can put the gospel accounts together and we were told that, that he, he sweat began to pour out of the forehead. Intense sweat, so much so like drops of blood. People who understand medical science talk about what that means is happening to your system physically. The, 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 the stress level that has come when, when blood bursts through the forehead. He fell on the ground. I, one preacher, one of my favorite preachers, years ago preached at a church where I was pastoring on this, on the, on the cup of wrath that Jesus was preparing to drink. And I, as long as I have a memory, I'll never forget the image. My children were there. Karen was there. He talked about how that, the anticipation of that Jesus was staggering as if he had become intoxicated under the prospect of the wrath of God. He falls to the ground. And prays that if it's possible, this hour might pass from him. Now, commentators are all over the map in terms of what he's talking about here when he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. They're all over the map. Those who, who find it easy to play fast and loose with Scripture say, well, there you go. I mean, here's a... Here's a Savior that had some real struggle about whether or not he wanted to be a Savior. I don't, I don't think it goes there. I think it's fair to just consider that in his humanity that he's about to experience something that as the eternal Son of God was unimaginable. Never experienced face to face fellowship, rich communion with the Father. The idea that He would become sin who knew no sin, that He would be treated by the Father as the ultimate sinner, as Adam should have been. He, the first, the second Adam, would receive the full, unmitigated fury of the wrath of God. 
for us in our place. The face-to-face fellowship with the Father would be broken. God would, as it were, turn His back on His Son so that Jesus would cry from the cross, My God, my God, why have You abandoned me? I think it's fair to see the Son of God as fully man as well as fully God. He feels it. It could well be, some commentators suggest that it's, it is what he's just talking about, that my soul is sorrowful even to death, that his, he has a concern that he will not physically make it to the hour of judgment, that the prospect of the agony and then what he would face before the judgment on the cross would kill him, the 39 lashes from the cat of nine tails, the beatings beyond recognition that this would kill him. I don't pretend to know the answer that there's mystery here. But behold the wondrous mystery. He cries out his God. He felt keenly the burden of the world's sin. Brothers and sisters, we've got to feel our sin that keenly. What must we look like from heaven when the angels, Peter says, they peer into the church. Paul talks about it. They want to understand the mystery of grace. Their darling the eternal Son of God, leaving heaven for a season and coming to live among a sinful people and and being mistreated by them and beaten and mocked and scorned and murdered and rising from the grave and ascending back on high. And they peer into the church to see what, what was the effect of this. And it must look strange to the angels when people for whom Jesus died treat sin so lightly. Look at how he shows us the importance of prayer. He communed with the Father often during his journey on the earth. And now in his darkest moment, knowing that it will be the Father. Oh yeah, he'll be, he'll be handed over, betrayed by Judas into the hands of the Romans. And ultimately the The police force of the Sanhedrin will arrest him and take him through the mock trials and hand him over to the Romans to be crucified. But he knows ultimately that it is the wrath of God that will be poured out upon him. And it's his Father who will do this. And he prays unto the Father. Brothers and sisters, we've got to learn this. It's interesting to me to watch what people turn to when life presses them and stresses them. They turn to all kinds of pleasure outlets to dull the pain. And yet, brothers and sisters, there's nothing that that absorbs the pain and makes the pain of life bearable like drawing near to God in union and communion with Him. James said it this way in James 5.13, Is anyone afflicted? Let him pray. Reminded of a fellow, two men were talking about a situation that was growing worse and worse. He said, well, what can we do? He said, well, we tried this and we tried this. And he said, well, what, is there anything else? He said, well, I'm afraid. All we can do now is pray. And the fellow said, has it come to that? What a strange statement. Jesus teaches us the importance of prayer. He teaches us also the importance of the submission to the will of God. It's okay to pray for healing. It's okay to pray for deliverance. It's okay to pray for for blessing. But they must always be couched in a nevertheless, Lord. I've just told you what what I think would would be beneficial in 
blessed and wonderful and glorious and redound into your glory, but nevertheless, Lord, not what I will, but what you will. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I've, as best I know my heart and understand the truth and, 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 and life, here, I've laid it out to you, but nevertheless, Lord, you know best. We've got to come to the place in life where we, we would say, I would, I would rather be suffering under the hand of God in the will of God than to be full of vigor out of the will of God. He teaches us that. J.C. Ryle in his expository comment, commentaries on the gospel said, nothing brings us so much misery on earth as having our own way. We sing, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. You're the potter. I'm the clay. So as we grow in a, in a disposition to submit our wills to the will of God, which I would su submit to you, is one of those tests, one of those measures when we find out, do we really belong to him? You see, it's okay to say, I, I belong to Jesus as long as the, the will of God for us is taking us into those places where we want to go. But when the will of God takes us into places that are painful and we don't want to go, what happens? It's oftentimes when we find out just who we're following. Finally, Jesus is abandoned in his agony. He comes and finds him sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Lord, others may deny you, but I'll never deny you. In fact, if I have to die, I'll die for you. Could you not even watch? Pray for me one hour. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And brothers and sisters, that is a truth that we've got to come to terms with. Paul faced it in Romans 7. Wretched man that I am, the things that I know I should be doing, I find myself not doing. The things I know I should not do, I find myself doing. Who will deliver me from this, this corpse that is strapped to me called remaining sin? The spirit is willing flesh is weak and the challenge of the Christian life is to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ to exercise the means of grace he would have us employ we might battle with remaining sin get the upper hand of it put to death the deeds of the flesh so he just lets them know this is your condition the spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak he goes away a second time he prays the same things, he comes back and finds them sleeping again. Says that their eyes are heavy. They're, they did not know what to answer him. And Keith Green died tragically, suddenly. They had a song called Asleep in the Light. I'm with the church being asleep in the light. Brothers and sisters, I'm not here to put a guilt trip on anybody or, or on myself, but we've got to recognize the mess that our country is in. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ has not sounded a clear sound. The pulpits have been ambivalent. The pews have been sleepy. You know, we... 9-11 sort of woke the church up for a while, woke the country up, but we all we went back to sleep. We're going to sleep through this election. Jesus warns against this. He came the third time. He's still sleeping, taking rest. It's enough. In other words, rest now. Because I'm about to be betrayed. The betrayer is at hand. He's come. Jesus is essentially in the garden, abandoned by those into whose lives he poured his life for three to three and a half years. And they will abandon him in what's about to happen to him then 
unspeakable atrocities. Brothers and sisters, we've got to ask ourselves, what, what does Jesus see when he looks at us? Does he see me sleepy? Sleeping on duty? You see, this shows us that there can be a lot of indifference even in the best of professing Christians. There were no better than these 11 on the earth at this time. We've got to guard against that spirit of lethargy, that spirit of complacency, that spirit of, of desiring our ease rather than embracing our duty. That spirit that says this is not this is not easy. This is not convenient. This is difficult. And, and, and run from that rather than embrace that. People talk about first responders, how they, how they run to the fire, how they run to trouble. And that's, that's to be con applauded and, and admired. But brothers and sisters, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ ought to, be, ought to be running to the battle, not hiding from it. We're to watch and pray. We're... We're soldiers. We're in hostile territory. We, you know, we may not have, we, we've said that. I've heard that preached since I was a little boy. I've preached it. But you know, we were generally accepted. Brothers and sisters, we are in hostile territory. This world is not our home. The God of this world has blinded the minds of, of your neighbors and your loved ones. Because he wants to drag them to hell. And we are the soldiers of the cross. We are the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. If we hide our light, if we pull back our saltiness, then darkness moves in. Darkness is never, darkness never fills a place except when light is taken out. Decay does not take place when the, when the retardation of salt is applied. We're going to watch and pray like soldiers. We're on enemy's ground. We're to be engaged in daily spiritual warfare, not fighting with the weapons of the world. I'm so weary of the vileness of this culture. I am, I am beyond frustrated that children can't, you can't even have children watch the presidential debates anymore. They have, they have denigrated into such, such, a, such a cesspool and, and you can't watch the news anymore because of the, of the talks about, about the candidates. It's just appalling. And yet this is where we live. We dare not retreat. We've got to go forward with the only message that saves. Brothers and sisters, many people in our nation are about to be utterly devastated. One of my dear friends, I'm convinced, died. He had a heart attack the week after the 2012 election. He could not believe that the country would reelect the fellow they did. And I, th and I think he died of a broken heart. It, we have got to go forward with the good news. Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again. The tomb is empty no matter, no matter what happens. The tomb is empty. We have the words of life. We have the way. We're going to look tonight at the, at the I am's of Jesus. Let's give great encouragement and comfort. Brothers and sisters, as I close, we, we, we cannot afford any longer to be asleep in the light. The church has got to wake up. We've got to be the church. Salt and light. Love and compassion. The good news. In a generation that really increasingly wants to see us gone. They would love to believe in a rapture thinking that we'll all get snatched out of here so they won't have to fool with us anymore. But we've got to live for Jesus.
while we live. And we've got to do it boldly. We've got to do it obviously. We've got to do it compassionately. We've got to do it intentionally. Accidentally, reactionarily, we'll not get it. We learn that when we study the frailty. We're frail creatures of dust. Thank God by, for, for grace. He doesn't save us because of what we can be, because of the prospects of how we'll help him win the game, as one fellow said one year. No, no, no. He saves us because he delights in showing mercy to great sinners. So I challenge myself as I challenge you today. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Understand the times. Like the sons of Issachar. Be wise, discerning the times. To know, as they did, to know what Israel ought to do. So, so we can know what we, the people of God, what manner of men and women we should be in times like this. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed Son of God, we, we come to you and we read this passage and, oh dear God, we see ourselves. I see myself in it. I, I'm rebuked. I, how many times, Lord, have you found me asleep in the light? How many times have I taken my ease when you've called us to be watchmen on the wall sounding the, the alarm? And now, Father, this neglect has come to our door. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive us. Help us. Help us as a church, whatever the rest of the culture may do, whatever the other church may do, help us as a church to rise. Sound the alarm, spread the good news that the tomb of Jesus Christ is still empty and he still sits on the throne, ever living to pray for his people, ever living to be beseeched, to cry out for mercy, ever living to show mercy to sinners. And I pray for those here today who have not yet come to Christ. That you'd save them by your grace and for your glory. Help those of us who know Christ to live for him. So obviously, so intentionally, that we'll be able to help others in the way who've lost their way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing.